I want to say that I love you all, my 2819 family, those of you in the room, our online family watching live right now in cities all across this country and pockets around the world. Those of you who are peeping us, who are living in Atlanta and trying to make a decision whether or not you need to be here, uh, just be here. Uh, we want to see you next Sunday. And we're so thankful for you. All of our guests who are in the room, visitors, and we welcome you to 2819 Church. And uh, to all of our friends who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ, uh, we welcome you. We are in the last four messages last four installments of a series called Kingdom Gems <clears throat> and in this series Kingdom Gems uh, we have been walking through the greatest sermon the world has ever known the Sermon on the Mount full-length sermon recorded by our Lord Jesus Christ in the first century AD uh, we've been walking through the sermon line by line verse by verse I want to keep reminding you as often as I can before we land the plane on this series that this is the blueprint for the best life possible. I don't know how else to tell you. I don't know how else to convince you. Out of 20 years of reading God's word and being convinced of the wisdom of God's word and just pairing into this one particular sermon. There are millions of sermons that have been recorded throughout history. This one sermon is the blueprint for the best life possible. It is the blueprint for human flourishing and personal thriving. And when the people of God lean into this sermon that has been preserved for us in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, written by an outcast Jew, saved by Jesus in the first century, a human being in this life, a follower of Christ, will live the best life possible. I find it a tragedy that the most important things Jesus said is also the least thing that is obeyed amongst the Christian church, especially in the United States of America. And I'm going to fight in these last four weeks to keep reminding you that with all of your complaints, with all your gripes, with all the things you're frustrated about, you will enter into the best life possible to the degree you lean into the teachings that are preserved for us in the Sermon on the Mount. Amen, my brothers and sisters. In this message, uh, we're going to be unpacking uh, Matthew chapter 7, just two verses, verses 13 and 14. Give an appropriate title to this text for my note takers. This message is not to be played with. This message right here is not to be played with. The devil will do everything he can to make you drift off while I'm talking and to make you argue in your mind while I'm talking because he knows what's coming in this message and the ones that's coming behind it. He knows that. He knows the word. We learned that when he was being, when Jesus was being tempted, the, script, the devil knows the scriptures. I would say he probably knows this word better than you, than a lot of us in here. He was quoting the Psalms to Jesus. This one right here, I would get down on my knees and beg you to pay attention to this message right here. It's two verses. It's two. Let's, let's tag a title to this text. We're just going to call it. only two ways not three not four not purgatory only two ways that's it
Spirit of the living God. I pray you would awaken the sons and daughters of the Most High. I pray you would arrest the attention of the sons and daughters of the Most High. I pray you would drive out of this room, out from across this camera, every spiritual distraction of the devil. Drive away weariness, though we was up late last night. Give us supernatural strength and stamina for the word of God. Open our eyes to see and our heart to believe. Give us revelation and insight. For what is more than a sermon, what is your divine word coming from heaven? Help this weakened earthen vessel. Declare to your people and to the outsider these salient truths. These words cannot fall to the floor. Agitate us, arrest us, change us. We ask this in the mighty and the majestic and the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If I could get three, four, maybe how many? 500 people in this room to just say, Only two ways. Family, I want to start this message by making a very bold statement that in your hearing when I make this statement, I already know is going to evoke different emotions in the room and across this camera. Yet the statement is very important and it is laced with a lot of truth and it is this, that your family and your experiences notwithstanding for the most part, every single person in this room, everyone watching me right now across this camera, you are for the most part right now as I'm talking to you, the sum total of your personal decisions. And it doesn't matter your background, or your experience or your education or where you are, you are for the most part, let me say it again, the sum total of your personal decisions. Where you are right now and where you will end up five years from now, 10 years from now, when you take your last breath will hinge totally on all of your personal decisions. Decisions are very powerful. Decisions are very consequential. Decisions are like seeds that every time you make one, they go into your future. Decisions are seeds that bring immediate harvest and decisions are seeds that bring harvest later on in your life in the future. Decisions are not to be played with. They are very, very powerful in our lives. Every day, every week, every month, every year, you and I will make tens of hundreds of of thousands, of tens of thousands of decisions and probably the apex of all our decision making is how you and I and any human being keep responding to the progressive revelation of God in our lives. The apex of all your decisions will probably continue to be how you respond to God, how you respond to the revelation of God, how you respond to the knowledge of God, the truth of God, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the conviction of God. Your most important decisions you will ever make in this life, they are connected to how every single one of us, every human being keeps responding to the Lord Jesus Christ in this life, whether to listen or to reject Him. That is the apex of your decision. There is no decision you will ever make greater than your continual response to the revelation of God in your life. Your decisions are very, very powerful. This was the case 
for tens of thousands of people sitting on the gentle slope of a Judean countryside in the first century AD listening to a celebrity rabbi named Jesus who at the onset of his ministry it blew up because his ministry was laced with these supernatural healings and these powerful teachings that caused thousands of people to follow him as he was healing and setting people free and preaching. And the scripture tells us it was Jesus looking out at the crowd, sat down on that gentle mountainside and he delivered to his followers and to seekers and to skeptics what would be called the Sermon on the Mount, the most powerful sermon, the most important sermon the world has ever known. Jesus taught them things like he taught them things like the Beatitudes, which was their kingdom identity. He went on for there. He taught them things about saw and light, which was their uh, kingdom identity. He taught them about the Beatitudes, which was their kingdom character. Excuse me. He taught them about the power of the word of God, saying he did not come to uh, get rid of the law, but to fulfill the law. He taught them about their emotions, about anger. He taught them about lust and divorce and their oaths. He taught them about human relationships and retaliation and loving your enemies. He went on to teach them about personal disciplines in the spirit, giving and praying and fasting. He went on to talk to them about stewardship, kingdom stewardship, about storing up treasures in heaven and not being anxious. He talked to them about their emotional health when it relates to anxiety. He talked to them about judging one another and about having kingdom discernment. And he talked to us about how to get a prayer through through asking, seeking, and knocking. And then Jesus comes down to the end of his sermon and now he pivots away from teaching. And now it's like he's looking out over this crowd and it's like he's saying, now that I've said all of this to you, like he's looking out over this crowd, now that I've said all of this to you, he pivots towards the end of his message and he makes a demand of them what he makes a demand of you and I and that is a decision. Now that I have spoken all of this, now that you have heard all of this, now that you have been aware of all this teaching, because one of the most dangerous things in this life is to be informed by the word of God. Because once you're informed, you're accountable. I mean, you can go around and stick your fingers in your ears and act childish if you want. But once you've been informed, you're accountable for what you've heard. And now that they have heard everything Jesus has to say in the Sermon on the Mount, he comes down and he demands of them what he demands of you and I, and that is a decision. His words were too powerful, too salient, too severe, too serious for just an amen. His words were too consequential for just an amen. His words were too consequential for just, I heard you, Rabbi, no. His words were so salient what Jesus demanded now from them. Watch. He demanded from the followers, from the seekers, and from the skeptics, now that you've heard everything I had to say, now I demand from all of y'all a decision. And his decision was so important, the decision they had to make, that he lands the plane on the Sermon on the Mount with these powerful illustrations. He talks to them first about two gates and then two trees and then two relationship statuses and then two houses and then two realities that ends in two different places. In this message, we're just going to unpack the first illustration, two gates. He finishes his teaching. He's getting ready to end. We'll study his clothes over the next three weeks. We're just going to look at the first one today, two gates. He says to them in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, he says, now that you have heard everything I've had to say, now that you've heard the kingdom teaching, now that you know that the kingdom has come in Christ, a new era has dawned, an era of grace, an era of warning, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Now that you know that the kingdom is coming like a tidal wave is going to envelop the whole world. Now that you know everything I've taught you about the kingdom. Now I want a decision from you. And look at how he lays out the decision. Verse 13. You heard everything I've had to say? Now here is my command to you. Watch the first word. It is an imperative in the original language of the scriptures. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Let me read to you one more time. Jesus finishes his teaching and he says to them, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. But he says, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. So it's like Jesus was saying to them what I'm saying to you right now. That it doesn't matter what you believe in the eyes of God, there are only two gates that lead to two ways that have two different endings. It doesn't matter what you believe or what you've been taught or what you've read on the internet. According to Jesus, in the eyes of God Almighty, there are only two gates, two ways that lead to two different endings. And if you study the words of Jesus carefully, if you follow his logic, watch. Every single human being is in one of these two gates. If you follow the logic of Jesus carefully, he's letting everyone know there is no other option. Every human being alive right now is behind either one of these two gates, is traveling down one of these two ways, and will end up in one of these two places. There is no other alternatives. There is no neutral gates. There is no other options. There is no third way. Two gates, two ways. Two permanent endings. Let's unpack them. Let's unpack two gates, two ways, two permanent endings. First, two gates. What do we know about these two gates? He says that there are two gates. One is narrow and one is broad. One gate is easy and the other one is hard. Let's talk about these two gates. The first gate has a name. The name of the first gate is called Christ. The only way to enter that gate, that gate requires a, a payment. It requires a payment of surrender, a payment of faith, a payment of belief, a payment of turning away from my former life. To enter into that gate, you cannot enter for free. That gate comes at a cost. The cost to enter that gate is salvation. It is repentance. It is turning my life over to Jesus Christ. It is being regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. That gate is narrow. That gate doesn't have enough room for my will and God's will. That gate is so narrow that I can only come in alone on my own personal confession, on my own personal decision, on my own personal being drawn to God. I can't come through that gate on my grandmother's faith on my father's faith, on my auntie's faith, on my brother's faith. I got to walk through that gate alone. I got to walk through that gate naked. I got to strip off the old man to begin my journey behind that gate. That gate is narrow because I can't come in with my wife next to me because I got to give my own account before the Lord. So I got to walk through that gate by myself. The other gate is broad. It has a name, the world. There's no requirement to enter that gate. We are born behind that gate and people are just running down that gate. That gate is easy. 
There's no requirements on the front side for that gate, but there is a heavy price it will exact on the other side of that gate. Both gates advertise the same thing. This way to real life. They both have the same promotion, the same ads, the same promise. Come through these gates, both of them lead to life. One of them is factual, the other one is deceptive. So both gates make a promise, but one, one gate delivers on that promise. And look what Jesus said. He didn't even leave it to you to figure out which gate you should go down. He, he loved you so much. He loved the people who was listening to him so much. He didn't want, listen, he cared about their soul so much. He didn't, he didn't even leave it up to you to figure out what gate to pass through. He says, enter the narrow gate. This word enter in the original language is an imperative. It is a command. It is forceful. It is a warning. It is come in here. Get in here. Come through this gate. Come to me. Surrender to me. Follow me. Come after me. You don't want no parts of the ending of the other gate. So we see we have two gates. One is narrow and one is broad. One gate has a name, it is Christ. The other gate has a name, it is world. Both of them make the same promise this way to real life. One gate will deliver on that promise. The other gate is deceptive. Two gates. What's behind these two gates? Let's talk about the two ways. The first way says it is easy. Let's talk about that way. And it is broad. One way is the broad way. Listen to me. The broad way, that is easy. It is paved with all the pleasures of this life. It is paved with everything you want to do in this life. That road is easy. It has no real sacrifices on that way. No sacrifices to God on that way. No turning away from sin on that way. That way is easy. Notice it says that there is many who travel that way. That means there's much company on that gate. The crowds are walking down this way. The Broadway is full of the crowds of the world. The Broadway is full of company. The Broadway is full of people who want to go in that direction. That's the Broadway. It has space for the whole world, that Broadway. Who are some of the travelers on the Broadway? The self-righteous are traveling down the Broadway. People who are, who are trying to watch, earn something from God with good behavior and with morality. The people who think that because I'm a good person, I'm going to heaven. Or because I'm moral, I'm going to heaven. Or because I was baptized as a baby, I'm going to heaven when you just got wet that day. The Broadway is all of the self-righteous, all of the people that think that because of their performance, and their good behavior and their morality, I'm guaranteed a ticket into heaven. Who else are the travelers of the Broadway? The self-deceived. The self-deceived are the travelers of the Broadway. The atheist is on the Broadway. The agnostic is traveling down the Broadway. The pagans are traveling down the Broadway. Every spinoff of Christianity is traveling down the Broadway. People attending the Kingdom Hall are on the Broadway. The Mormons are on the Broadway. Every false Christian religion is on the Broadway. People who don't believe in God are traveling down the Broadway. Scientists who got 18 degrees, who the scripture calls a fool, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, are on the Broadway. The Broadway is full of everybody we admire in society. Influencers are on the Broadway. Athletes are on the Broadway. Rappers are on the Broadway. Family members are on the Broadway. Friends are on the Broadway. People we love are on the Broadway. People sitting in this room are on the Broadway. Someone watching me right now are traveling down the Broadway. 
And for most of us, we just go down this path because it's easy to follow. We see the crowds of people in front of us. We think the Broadway is really all that life has to offer. The Broadway is sparkly, it's beautiful, it's nice, it's easy. People who hop in and out of church and don't really have no commitment to God are going down the Broadway. People who are vacillating are going down the Broadway. I mean, millions and millions and millions of people are traveling the Broadway. Whole nations are going down the Broadway. Islamic nations are going down the Broadway. Whole countries and nations are traveling down the Broadway. Somebody sitting on your row right now. It's traveling down the Broadway. You got people in churches all across America right now. Right now as I'm talking to you, they are traveling down the Broadway. They're in church every Sunday. They warm a chair, but they're far away from God, thinking that they're safe, thinking that they're comfortable, not knowing they're a car accident away from trouble, one breath away from trouble, a stroke away from trouble. Traveling down the Broadway. Satan is the architect of the Broadway. He is the foreman of the Broadway. He is the builder of the Broadway. He has put at the front of the gate of the Broadway everything that is sparkly and tickles the flesh and tickles the ears. Everything we love in our human desires, he's put at the front of the Broadway. He's dangling carrots for all manner of unsuspecting people. Keep coming down the Broadway. He's blinding people from the knowledge of God as they're walking down the Broadway. Stay away from church. Stay away from preaching. Stay away from real teaching. Stay away from biblical ministry. Keep doing you. Do you live your truth on the Broadway? Everybody got their own truth on the Broadway. They're trusting in crystals on the Broadway. They're trusting in horoscopes on the Broadway. They're trusting in fortune tellers on the Broadway. They're trusting in the little jujubes and the idols you have in your pockets and in your house on the Broadway. You're trusting in your own morality on the Broadway. You're trusting your connections to other people on the Broadway. While all y'all staring at me with your eyeballs, I'm telling you right now, I'm looking at hundreds of eyes, and I'm telling you, not everybody in this room is on that narrow path. There are people sitting here listening to my voice right now that you don't even realize you're on the Broadway. How can you? The scripture says it is Satan who blinds the mind of the unbeliever so they cannot see the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're wearing the sunglasses of darkness on the Broadway. The Broadway is spiritually dark. It is dangerous. It is fun for a season and you can enjoy your life and do everything you want to do on the Broadway. The Broadway affords you every pleasure the world has to offer. I shed tears this morning for family members and friends who are on the Broadway. And probably the most tragic thing is that, listen to me, like atheists on the Broadway, agnostics on the Broadway, people who, who blaspheme God, they mock him in the streets in South America, they do demonic stuff at the Grammys. Like, I, I feel you. I think the worst thing is, is that people who call themselves Christians are on the Broadway. How do we know? Because later on in verse 21, Jesus would say, we'll get to that next week, two weeks from now. Not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That there are people who really think they're Christians. They really think they're following God. They really think they're saved, but they're actually on the Broadway. The Broadway, there's no price for that. You ain't fasting and grinding for Jesus on the Broadway. 
You ain't sacrificing and making no sacrifices of the flesh on the broad way. What did Jesus says? The broad way is a life of ease and comfort. So if you feel no pressure from God, man, there are Christians all over America right now that are going down the broad way, listening to demons in pulpits, traveling down the broad way, listening to lies on Sunday morning, traveling down the broad way, keeping up for yourself teachers because you got itching ears, traveling down the broad way. They're going to keep you comfortable until you end up on the backside of the wrong of the broad way you never hear about sin on the broad way you're never confronted on the broad way your toes are never stepped on on the broad way you never feel convicted on the broad way you're never challenged on the broad way you don't hear anything that makes you feel uncomfortable on the broad way you sit in churches where they never talk about sin they never challenge you about your life. Auditoriums are packed with Christians on the Broadway. Jesus said this. Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord. There are people you've been in church your whole life. And you think because you were born in church, you're, but you're on the Broadway. Religious people on the Broadway. The self-sufficient are on the Broadway. People who think I don't need God are on the Broadway. The self-religious, the self-reliant, right? The self-deceived, all of these groups are on the Broadway. I was on the Broadway. Y'all sitting here staring at me and some of you I'm talking to you right now. You got family members and friends. You, you, you're so churchy. They're on the Broadway. You ain't praying for them. Because your prayers are full of yourself. And you never hear teaching like this on the Broadway. I got people I love who are on the Broadway. Who have no idea what's coming at the end of that path. You got people in this room right now, you play in church, and you don't even realize you, you, you standing in here during worship, and you're coming in here twice a month, and you're traveling down the Broadway. But Jesus said, there is another way. It will come at a cost. It will cost you a confession. It will cost you your will. He said that way is hard. He said that way is hard. I got to pray on that way. Every now and then, I got to fast on that way. I got to die on that way. I look at my old self and I say, dang, I can't keep carrying you down this way. It gets too narrow to keep carrying that fleshly old man down this way. The path gets so narrow, it gets to the point that either the godly me could go forward or the fleshly me could go forward, but both of me can't make it down the narrow way. One of me will have to die to get to the, others, the other end of the narrow way. It's like when Paul keeps teaching people in Colossians, you got to keep dying to that old man because he's trying to lead Christians down the narrow way. There's not enough space for all of my past and all of my future on the narrow way. There's not enough space for all of my attitude and all of my nastiness and all of my righteousness down the narrow way. There's not enough space for me to be tearing down my brothers and sisters and then saying, bless the Lord on Sunday morning down the narrow way. There's not enough space for me to be a hypocrite my whole life and then come in church and say, bless the Lord down the narrow way. There's not enough space for all of my will and all of his will down the narrow way. The narrow way will cost me something. It may cost me my will. Can I go further? Can I go a little bit deeper? 
I'm about to hurt, especially us American Christians. It may cost you your pre-salvation dreams. Notice I didn't say your God-given dreams. The narrow way may cost you your pre-salvation dreams. I wanted to be an attorney. The narrow way did not afford me that. I wanted to do something else with my life. The narrow way did not afford me that. I was headed to law school that was called into the ministry. The narrow way did not afford me that. It may cost you your pre-salvation dreams. It may cost you your personal will. It may cost you your nasty attitude, your bad ways. It may cost you your bad mouth. It may cost you your bitterness, your unforgiveness, your revelry. It may cost you your, your false will to hold on to grudges. It may cost you unforgiveness. It may cost you keeping people in your heart like it's an apartment instead of letting them go. It may cost you what you want to do for what God has for you. And for millions of Christians throughout the ages, it may even cost you your life. Two gates, two ways, only two permanent endings. The first one, Jesus said it. This Broadway, he says, it leads to this word called destruction. You could travel it for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. You can build a massive fortune. You could be wealthy and famous. But when your last breath is drawn, if you was traveling on that Broadway and your breath leaves your house, Jesus says the end of the Broadway, watch this, is this word called destruction. That's a toned down word for eternal damnation, permanent separation from God, in consciousness of a fiery hell that Satan designed to bring people in this life captive all the way down to this place of destruction, a place God created for the devil and demons. And he did not intend for people to be there. But the God of this world is blinding all these people on the Broadway and is trapping them with, with carrots to lead them all the way to destruction. That you can't see the end on the Broadway until you have taken your last breath, you wake up on the other side of eternity, you cry for mercy, but it's too late. And Jesus said, but the narrow way, man, it ends where? In eternal life. Some of you, not just heaven. You got the wrong concept of heaven. You think heaven is just harps and floating around on crowds, on clouds. Man, that's boring to me. I, I'm a, I'm a, I like activity. I can't be playing a harp and floating on a cloud forever. See? See? Some of you even been taught wrong. Heaven is temporary. Can I teach? Heaven is, you need to read Revelation. Heaven is temporary. How could that be? The scripture says in the end, God himself. I heard somebody say the other day, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. No, only for the believer. So when the believer dies, they go straight to the presence of the Lord. But the scripture says, where is the Lord? He is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Will he stay there forever? No. The scripture says that when all is said and done, the Lord will watch, return to the new earth, new trees, new water, new nations, new rulers. A whole new world with no sin, no darkness. I'm done, Frank. The Lord will return with his saints to the new earth. And there they will be in the new earth, new trees, new nations, new worlds, new life, new government ruled by Jesus forever. We'll be living and breathing and eating and picking fruit from a tree of life and drinking water so clear we've never seen before.
no aging, no sickness, no disease, no tears, no doctor's reports, no trouble, no worries, no drama, no issues, no strokes, no bad relationships, no unforgiveness, no wounds, no trials, no troubles, no tribulations. None of that. But a price got to be paid now. That word narrow in the Greek means, it means difficult, painful. That for those of us who are in Christ, it is difficult now. It is painful now. It is sacrifice now, faithfulness now, generosity now, grind now, surrender now, bow now. Lord, not my will, but your will now. It's the payment we got to make now for the reward of the end of the narrow way. Two gates, two ways, two permanent endings. There is no other option. There is no other way. There is no purgatory. There is no getting out of hell. There is no do-over. There is no second chance when you draw your last breath. You get one shot to get this right. The right of Hebrew says it is appointed to a man to live once and then he must face the judgment. You get one shot and your shot ends when you draw your last breath. He said, well, I'm young. I'm in my 20s. I'm a millennial. I'm a Gen Z. I'm balling. You don't even know when your last breath is coming. I graduated from North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina, and one of their, one of their, one of their athletes died, a 20-something year, died this week. One of my friends was 40-something years old, 40 years old, died this week. When your last breath is drawn, whatever gate you was behind, whatever way you was on, man, it seals your fate. This is why Jesus yells at the people on that hillside, enter into the narrow gate, get in here. This is safety, this is real life. This will lead you to the end. Come to me, run to me, surrender to me, get in here. Come through that gate. Yes, it's narrow, yes, it's difficult, yes, it's gonna cost you. But what you get at the end, Oh, I hear somebody in the room. I already know you in here. I hear you, preacher. I don't believe all that, though. I hear you. All right. Cool. Don't believe me. But who's talking? It's red. Who's talking? You know who's talking? The Son of God. The one who came from eternity. The one who performed miracles. The one who was raised from the dead. Watch. The only person that knows what's on the other side of death. The one who came from eternity into time to tell us, go through the narrow way. How could you not believe him? You roll your dice on your own intellect. Yo, I'm going to roll my dice on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our boy MG in here, when we was young, we used to play this game called CeeLo in Queens, right? If you, if you roll, if you lost, you roll what's called craps. If you win, you roll what's called CeeLo. I got four, five, six. You don't got to believe me, but watch. You got to make a decision though. Either Jesus is telling the truth or he's a liar. You could gamble with your life and your last breath to see was he credible or not.
I ain't, I ain't rolling the dice on the fact that he's not credible. If someone can die and be resurrected from a grave, I'm inclined to roll my dice on that man. Two gates. Two ways. Two permanent endings. And when you hear the Lord knocking on your heart, you got to make your own decision. I already made mine the narrow way. I pray you make the right decision. Let's pray. Come on. Christians pray. I'm trying to snatch some people out of this room who are on the Broadway right now. If you know how to pray, pray. Please, Jesus, pray. If somebody watching me on camera right now, traveling down the Broadway to destruction, I'm about to do everything I can to stop them right now. I'm so serious. Come on. Stir this room with faith. We about to tear down the lies of the devil in this room and snatch men and women from the Broadway. Pray, Christian, pray. Eternal God and ever wise Father, Lord, we thank you for the eternal truth of your word. It's forever settled in heaven. I pray for these, my brothers and sisters, Lord, that we would be awakened to your truth. That we would care deeply about those on the Broadway. That we would pray for those on the Broadway. That we would push forth the gospel. To rescue those on the Broadway. We pray, Lord, for the spread of your glorious message. We pray, Lord, for the planting of new churches. We pray, Lord, for the spread of the gospel across this city, across this nation, around the world, that you may keep harvesting to yourself. The family you want to reap from the Broadway. God, I pray for my church family. Awaken them, Lord. Let them care deeply, Lord. Let their eyes be open to the millions of people on the Broadway, Lord. On social media, Lord. All across this nation, let us be aware of the millions of people on the Broadway, Lord. Let us cry out for their salvation, Jesus. Awaken your sons and daughters in this nation, Jesus. Now, Lord, do it now. Before time has run out, God, awaken us, Lord. Before time has run out, God, awaken us, Lord. Listen to me. Keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. I ain't even playing around with you. You in this room, you're not saved. You don't belong to Jesus. You've been in church your whole life and you're not saved. You traveling down that broad way and you're not saved. You know it because you're not paying no price for Christianity. You got one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom. You already know who you are. Man, 
pray, believers pray. The Lord Jesus Christ died for you. Live the perfect life that you could not live. Die a sacrificial death that you could not pay. To exchange your punishment for forgiveness. <coughs> and if anyone would just repent, put their faith in Christ. The scripture says you could be made new, you could be regenerated, not by some fancy prayer, but by the power of God. I want to pray for you. Man, you already know who I'm talking to. I ain't playing around. Come meet me at this altar right now. We ain't playing. Get off that broad path. Get off. Get off the broad path. Come on, Ryan. Get off that broad path. Get off of it. Come on, get off of it. Get off of it. Get off. Get off of it. Come over that Broadway. Come on. Get off of it. You make all things new. Come on, get off of it. Get off of it. Get off of you. Get off of that Broadway. Get off of it. Come on, get off of it. Get off of it. Get off of that Broadway! <laughs> Come on, get off of it! What are we doing? Come on, what are we doing? Come on, get off of that Broadway! You
eternal God and of a wise father. I pray over all these men and women being regenerated by the power of your spirit, shedding tears of repentance. These are the harvests of the preaching of the word of God. These are your new sons and daughters. May the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. We thank you that they belong to you, that all of their sins have been forgiven, that they have been washed in the blood of the lamb, that their names have been recorded in heaven, that eternity is their home and hell was their former destination. We thank you that the devil just lost these. We thank you, Lord. You said when one sinner repents, all of heaven rejoices. So, Father, we rejoice, God. Woo!